Hello, I'm Angie, a food security analyst on the MVAM team. And in this video, I'm going to guide you through the remote data collection lifecycle. Our key message here is that the process is open, consultative, and iterative. The first thing you need to do is engage your partners. The partners are the people who are going to use the information that our survey will produce. We engage with them to ensure that we design the survey around their needs by finding out, first, the issues that they're interested in, second, their priority groups and areas, third, how frequently they need updates, fourth, how the data will be shared once it has been collected, and finally, what types of reporting are most appropriate. The answers that your partners provide to these questions help you design the survey and deliver a product that ultimately meets operational needs. Then you can start to design the survey. Make sure you take any limiting factors into account when designing your survey. These could include financial and human resources or the availability of a call center in your chosen geographical location. Next, you design the questionnaire. When designing the questionnaire, you need to focus on what information you want while taking other important factors into account. These include how you can best ask certain questions, whether the survey length is suitable for the tool you're using, and can the questions be understood by potential respondents. Then we design how the population will be sampled, thinking about the target population, the frequency of data collection, and how respondent and reserve pools are going to be generated. Finally, you should consult with a number of specialists. They could include a key partner, an analyst who has relevant contextual experience. This could be you a representative from a third-party survey operator if you're using one, and of course, a questionnaire design expert. Each member can provide feedback on your survey according to their area of expertise. Now you can start to refine your survey. First, design a focus group discussion with the target population. This is needed to understand the perspective of your target respondents and identify issues that could lead to bias. It should also consider what types of technologies potential respondents use. Conducting a focus group interview will help ensure the questions you ask in the survey are relevant, appropriate, and well understood. Then you design a pilot survey. The pilot should be at least 10% of the size of the final survey and have no fewer than 50 samples. The pilot is essential to gauging respondent comprehension data quality issues, and geographic coverage. With the results of the pilot, you can adjust the survey analysis to limit bias. This allows you to think about which sociodemographic groups are over or underrepresented. Find ideal sociodemographic proxy measures and find secondary sources you can use to contextualize this information. You then go back to the specialists to consult them on any issues that have been raised by the pilot. Once this process is complete, it's possible to re redesign the survey. This could mean replacing or including new indicators or questions, or refining the language used in the survey if participants have not really understood any of the questions. If the bias is too large, you could replace household questions with community questions. Throughout this, you should streamline as much as possible the survey process that you can. It might also be necessary to go back to a focus group for that. With the finalized survey, you begin collecting data using the tools that have worked best in the pilot. All raw data should be uploaded and cataloged in a central database and cleaned. Once you have collected a sufficient sample, you can finally perform the analysis. While you do this, you need to think about whether your results make sense, if there are secondary sources to back up our findings, what correlations or relationships we can see with other variables, and if there are any interesting trends or changes. We then check all findings for statistical significance. Finally, when the results are ready, you report the findings and communicate them. Always remember to report information, not data. Make sure your reporting is highly visual and limit the amount of text. Avoid jargon, and be sure to use statements that are clear and easy to understand. You should also be careful to use appropriate communication channels, depending on what information you're sharing with whom. 
But the remote data collection lifecycle shouldn't stop there. You need to ensure that the survey is continuously improved. You need to keep engaging with your partners. Maybe there's more that can be done to get them the information that they need. Or perhaps there are new questions that need to be explored. Partners can be engaged by soliciting feedback on reports through ad hoc meetings or via online questionnaires, whatever works. Check in with the specialist to see what additional changes can be made. Feel free to bring in new ones as the survey evolves. These could be academics, consultants, or people from other humanitarian organizations. Periodically, you need to go back and refine the questionnaire and sample frame with knowledge gained over several rounds. You should think about whether the questions that need to be addressed are still the same, or whether you should alter the questionnaire. Maybe some of the variables are insignificant and can be removed from the survey. You should always be thinking of new approaches and methodologies to dig deeper into the data. Thank you for watching this brief overview of the remote data collection lifecycle.